how does taking a walk improve your creativity? Yes. Yeah, so the creative walking is kind of one of these things. I, I think walk, we, we're, we're damned with this one word, uh, which for this uh, activity that does so many things. Um, Wait, are you saying there's different types of walking? Of course. The general idea here is that we've got one word for an activity, which is walking, mm. but mm-hmm. we walk for all sorts of different purposes. So uh, my kind of key point that I want to, to get across is that uh, we're, we're cursed because we have this one word uh, which uh, allows us or which, which is a label for something that uh, ends up being lots and lots of different things. Mm. So um, I've mentioned social walking already. You've mentioned yes. it. we walk together. We've mentioned walking for health. So what do we call that? Health walking? I don't know. Healthy walking. <laughs> I'm sure we could come up with a phrase. Um, and then there's walking for creative, creative ideation. Uh, How do you do that? that? Uh, well, you do it by going and walking and thinking. Um, <laughs> it's that well, well, let me let me, no, let me ask you because it doesn't sound that simple. So I'm in the middle of writing my next book. Yeah, and I'm at a bit of a of a. Let's just say I have hit a wall, and I I've got writer's block. I can't figure out the order of the table of contents. How do you go for a walk to have the maximum benefit? if you want to have kind of creative ideation? Yes, so there's a couple of ways of approaching this. And I I think, first of all, we have to think about uh, what it is we mean by creativity and how the brain can be creative. Um, And one of the things that's, I think, very clear is that constantly focusing on a problem that you're finding difficult to solve is the worst way to go about solving that problem. Um, what you need is time away from the task as well as time on the task. And there are lots of ways of, of, of showing this. Uh, one very simple way is, is to give people compli- complicated logic problems to solve and uh, just letting them read them and then uh, letting them have a night's sleep and getting them to solve them in the morning. And what you'll find is that people are very, very good at solving those problems in the morning, even though they haven't been ostensibly thinking about them during the course of their sleep. But of course, lots of things happen in sleep in terms of of reorganization of knowledge and consolidation of memory and all of that kind of thing, which I think we're only really starting to to kind of to appreciate. Now, where walking and creativity is concerned, there are lots of ways of of demonstrating this. But I I think the first thing to say is that Walking uh, and creativity have been recognized by philosophy and mathematicians and lots of other people for uh, probably centuries as being intimately related. And psychology has only caught up on this in the, in the last 10 or 20 years, which is uh, we're, we're really only at the early stages of trying to figure this one out. So uh, in my own case, I dictated a lot of the book um, to get a first draft. And how did I do that? Well, what I would do is very simple. Uh, I would write down bullet points on a, on a, a page and take a, a, a dictaphone with me, not a telephone, um, because that thing is just too uh, distracting. Um, what happens when you have a phone on you or in your hand when you're walking? How does that rob you of some of the benefit? I don't know that it robs you. Uh, what it does, I suppose, there, there, there's a, an ambiguous literature on this. People who are good at texting while walking tend to have very good peripheral vision uh, <laughs> compared, and this seems to be trainable. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that it's a bad thing. Um, but if you, if you have a problem that you're trying to solve, what you really need is to spend time with your own thoughts, uh, not with a phone. Um, uh, so you shouldn't have the thing in your hand. And that's why, for example, when I when I dictate, I will never dictate into the phone because I don't want to see uh, mm. alerts coming in. I don't want to have the temptation of checking emails or, or anything like that. Um, and a key part of, of walk, of, sorry, of creative uh, thinking is the, the preparation and incubation kind of stage. And then so how, what do I mean by preparation? This is the kind of research stage. And then you just need to let the ideas percolate around, come together in a variety of different ways. So you can go for a walk where uh, you just decide not to think of uh, the problems that you're working on, that you're going to go out for 20 minutes or a half an hour and not think about them at all. 
Uh, the other thing you can do, and this is up to you as an individual or your listeners as, as individuals, is to do the other thing, which is to walk and think loosely about the uh, problem that you've got. Not in, in very defined terms, but think uh, in very kind of loose terms so that you, what you're trying to do is discover associations uh, and connections that weren't obvious to you when you were sitting there breaking your fingers on the keyboard and banging your head <laughs> off your desk because you, you weren't able to, to solve the problem. So I, I, th I think we're still at a sufficiently early stage in trying to understand the relationship between creativity and, and walking that we don't have a definitive recipe. What we can say, though, is that um, if people undertake walks before they have to engage in, in problem solving, um, the numbers of creative ideas that they come up with uh, go up substantially compared to people who've been sitting uh, and not moving for the same period. Uh, so why is that? I, well, go on. Yeah. No, go ahead. I Because I, what I read in your book is that it can it can increase creativity two times. Like it 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 really boosts the creative flow in your brain. And then you were about to say, why is that? Yeah. So th there's a couple of potential reasons. So uh, um, the, I think one of the major discoveries in neuroscience over the last kind of 20 or 25 years is this idea of default activity in the brain. Um, and default activity is, is the kind of what we revert to when we're not watching telly and we're uh, just not uh, when we're instructed not to think of anything at all. What do we think about? We think about our social relations. We think about problems that are important to us. We're not engaged in focal thought. We're, we're moving backwards and forwards on a mental timeline, uh, what we did in the past, what we did yesterday, what we're planning to do tomorrow. And we're thinking about our social relations. Mm -hmm. And what we now know from the uh, uh, the kind of brain imaging literature is that when people are engaged in, in creative problem solving, they're doing two things simultaneously. And this is something that you have to practice. It's not easy to do. You're kind of uh, focused on this big picture. And at the same time, you're focused on the detail. This is a hard thing to do. So the, the metaphor I use in the book is you're trying to see the forest and the trees at the same mm. time. Okay. Or you're flickering between these two states where you're zooming back from something and then you're focused in on the detail. And the wonderful thing about walking is uh, I think it frees you for thinking that you wouldn't be able to engage in if you're just sitting there at your computer um, because you're not trapped by this little small screen and what's in front of you. You've got a chance to cogitate on lots and lots of other things. And that's why, for example, when I when I walk, uh, I, I just happen to notice on my desk here, I have a, I have a page of them. Uh, I've scribbled notes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I take my dictaphone and I'll look at those and I'll ignore people looking at me <laughs> and I will dictate from them. Um, and you end up with uh, thoughts and ideas that you wouldn't otherwise have had. Uh, and again, the key point is that you're not engaging in uh, distracted walking uh, in the sense that you're walking around with this thing in your hand. Uh, right, you found what, what, what you're doing is engaging in a kind of a mental zigzag between different ideas um, until you find the one that makes you go, aha, that's the way I need to do it. And it might be a big idea or it might be a small idea. Um, you know, you might have a small personal thing that you need to sort out or it might be some big thing like sorting out a table of contents for a, a book is a big deal. It's, it's really annoying and getting it right is really important because otherwise the book itself will fail. Well, you know, I'm sitting here wondering if one of the reasons why walking helps you have more creative ideas is because it has this ability to suppress the default mode network and that sort of chattering that is going on in the subconscious on default when you're sitting still and staring at a computer, that there's something about the brain moving your body, the feet on the ground, the optic flow of your eyes moving back and forth and the sense of movement and how all of that must quiet a part of your brain that you're not able to tap into when you're sedentary. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the idea that I, 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 I get to with this concept of mindlessness. 
um, that uh, with mindfulness, you're paying attention to the flow of thoughts mm. through your head. Uh, but when you're being mindless, uh, you're not paying attention to anything in particular. Um, and I, I, I think there's an important psychological distinction between those two things, one where you're actively attending to the flow of thoughts and the other where you're uh, getting out of your own head and freeing yourself from that flow of thoughts. And uh, but I think there's also something else goes on, which is going on as well. Uh, at the moment, I'm seated. Uh, now, I'm not using the, the back of the chair, so I'm, I'm, I'm seated forward. So there's a, a little bit more strain on my body, uh, which is a, 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 a good thing for the, the purposes of this conversation. Why is that? Well, uh, parts of my brain that would be quiet, uh, quiescent, um, are active because they're there trying to maintain my balance. Mm. Uh, you can see I'm gesturing wildly when I'm, when I'm talking to you as well. Um, and the, the kind of idea that I have is that uh, ideas that are just below the level of consciousness uh, get tickled a bit because your brain is a bit more active and they bubble up into consciousness and then you can consider them. Uh, whereas if you're hunchback and there's not a lot going on, you end up uh, uh, somewhat blank and uh, there's nothing uh, coming to mind. Well, I love that visual because what I just got when you use the word tickle is that when you're outside and you know, you're in nature and you're moving your body and you've got that state of optic flow happening, I kind of picture almost like the energy of your body is creating like the effect of turning the knob on a stove. And so things start to bubble in your mind due to the energy and the activity in your body. Yeah. Um, how short of a walk makes a difference? Like if somebody were to simply just start doing a 10 minute walk every day outside in a wooded area or a quiet area without their headphones on, over time, would that make a big difference? Would they likely feel a boost in their mood? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking a lot of people don't, are too sedentary because they think it's going to take 30 minutes or they think it's going to take an hour. They think it's going to be hard. So there's good news and bad news uh, here. Okay. <laughs> so, the, so the good news is that you don't have to do a half hour. You don't have to do 40 minutes in one burst. In fact, the, the, the good news is that uh, lots of small bursts distributed right throughout the day is actually probably the best thing for you. That uh, if you if you look at humans that live in non mechanized groups, uh, they're not engaging in a sudden burst of activity and then doing nothing. What they're engaging in, in is lots of low level activity distributed right throughout the day with rest periods. So the advice to get up and walk for two minutes every half hour or whatever is really good advice rather than than sitting at, at your computer. Uh, for that time. Now, you can get a benefit from a two-minute walk? Just, even from a little bit of uh, activity. You don't need to do a lot, but you do need to do some. Now, here's the bad news. Uh, most humans in Western societies are not moving at all, uh, are not moving very much. So we know this from mobile phone, uh, smartphone data, uh, which you can grab uh, the, the levels of activity that people engage in. And uh, what you see in, in Western societies, Ireland, uh, the US, the UK, France, and all the rest of them, is sadly that people don't walk very much. The average adult in uh, uh, the US, for example, walks at a, about 4,000 steps a day. Now, a child learning to walk does about 1,200 steps per hour. Um, Whoa. So there's a huge difference. The, and the country that walks the most is Japan. Um, why? Because uh, they have cities that are car hostile, despite them being one of the uh, major car producers on the planet. Um, because it's a very small country and there's lots of people, they uh, walk an awful lot. Um, and uh, as I said, most people don't walk very much. So my, my advice is always walk about 5000 steps per day more than you're doing. And that gets you, for most people, very close to that magic 10,000 steps, which uh, is- Where did that come from? It's Where a made up, no, it's made up. <laughs> um, there, there are all sorts of apocryphal tales about where it came from. Um, one is- Which one it, is your favorite? Uh, I, I think the one that I like the best is that it's a mistranslation from a, a, a Japanese activity company in the 60s. I, I don't know if it's true or not. However, uh, what we do know is that if you look 
at all what's called all cause mortality, your likelihood of dying of anything rises the more inactive that you are and it falls the more active you are. So at somewhere between about four and a half thousand and seven and a half thousand steps per day, people's all cause mortality falls and falls quite substantially, something like 30 or 40 percent. You must turn on your mobile phone and find out how many steps you're walking per day, because most people don't know. OK, uh, so that's the, f the first thing you need to do. OK. And uh, what you'll find for most people most of the time is that they're not walking very much at all. It's okay. probably around three or four thousand steps a day. And that increases your chances of dying younger of something unpleasant. I got twenty eight hundred steps right now. So, yeah. So you, you need to add five thousand steps. to that. OK, how big of a distance is that? Um, I guess it's about five kilometers or four and a half kilometers. That's a lot. So I have to walk two miles a day, two and a half miles a day, you're saying? Yeah, to my mind, it's not much at all. Um, but uh, I, I can boast because I did 9,785 steps today. And uh, Shane with the flex, everybody. He's holding up his phone. <laughs> well, you are the walking guy. I would hope you walk every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm really curious to hear what you think of our topic because you and I are going to dig into the science of walking. Yep, <laughs> you heard it. We're going to talk about the extraordinary benefit to your mind, body, and spirit 